Let's pray. Father, we have come again to be blessed and to bless you. So I pray, help us, Lord, to be in that posture of mind that is humble before you and trembles at your word, that lets you speak and impress. Save us, Lord, from routine religion. We've been warned that nominal Christianity is to be feared and dreaded. We cannot light our own taper. We cannot wash away our own sins. We come to you, the author and finisher of our faith. And we're asking now, Lord, that in this moment, your presence would be here. We would be strengthened. We would follow as you lead and listen with a surrendered heart willing to obey. Now bless us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to start this message reminding you of the times in which we're living. I had uh, Rob Rice, our Bible instructor, point out to me a film that was released on October 4 called The Pope, The Environmental Crisis, and Frontline Leaders, and the letter Ludato Si film. In the last 11 days, it has 4,304,000 views, and it's going up by about 400,000 views. You should watch it. I want you to watch it, not because I want you to subscribe to what it's saying, but I want you to see the art, the craft, the subtlety, the power of video and videography leveraged to capture the heart and shape the corporate culture of our world. I want you to watch it because what we just went through in regards to the liberty of conscience issues surrounding COVID was just a little shaking, just a little warm up, just a little wake up on how the future world will work. And of course, you do not have to listen. We long since passed dialogue about climate warming. We have moved into climate emergency, climate catastrophe, all these other things. And mind you, friends, I'm not here to say there are not and is not a climate catastrophe looming before us. This world is growing old like a garment. Have you read that anywhere before? The issue is whether or not we can save the planet. I tell you, the inhabitants, we can. The planet itself, we cannot. Now, having said that, we are stewards. We take so much of our theology from the book of Genesis and from the very first three chapters. And even this church is in its own dialogue at a leadership level about how we can both make statements that we care without subscribing to the idea of an atheistic, secular salvation of the planet for future rounds of unending generations. That's not happening. It's not in the Bible, and it's not in our future. Glorious good news, a geriatric planet is going to be replaced with no geriatric people and a brand new, beautiful garden, country home, city home in the house of God. Can you say amen? amen? This is where we're headed. This is what the Bible says. The storyline of the great controversy is coming true from Scripture and the writings of the prophetic pen. But I want you to understand this video has kind of slipped out onto the Internet, and it is one of the YouTube favorites and it is taking the world in videography uh, data by storm. Now, I want to go just a little farther before I actually start on the subject matter of the angel and the hour, the shaking and the power. Jesus told two things in Matthew 13. One, he told the parable of the sower. And in telling the parable of the sower, he told about some seed that grew in good soil, but there was a problem. And the problem was what? But that same soil also had some weed seeds in it. This is what represents the church. This is the potential to represent my life and yours. What I want you to know is that if ever there was a time to stop and say to yourself, on the cusp of eternity, what should I be giving my time to? That day is today. You're living in an age where what would you trade for your eternal well-being? for eternal assurance, and for the glorification that comes with seeing Jesus come in the clouds. What I'm saying to you is this. Jesus directed us to come together all the more so as you see the day approaching. 
That's because there are some blessings he has chosen to deliver at the hand and the mouth of the sister or the brother sitting down the pew from you. And those blessings undelivered float away without benefit. It's also because sometimes in an age that so emphasizes encouragement and affirmation that we need a word of accountability. But accountability words don't land well on poor relationships. They sometimes don't land well on good relationships. What I'm saying to you is this. You are a very busy person. But it's very possible that the weeds that grow faster than the wheat are seeking to choke out that genuine love, affection, obedience, and availability for Christ. Super, super important. I also want to take from Matthew 13 another warning. There was a sower who sowed seeds. They were good seeds, but in the night, the devil came, the enemy came, and he sowed tares. It, didn't, it took a little while. At first, they looked enough alike, but there was a moment in time when a discerning gardener said, that's not what I planted. And he said to the owner, would you like me to weed this garden now or would you like me to leave it alone? He said, leave it alone because you might make some mistakes at this point in the game. But that garden has grown and that harvest is ripening. And what you're seeing in the world through the retracting of the Holy Spirit is you are seeing a exceptional polarization in the world. Now listen to me very carefully. If you're a Methodist, your church is split. If you're a Baptist, your church is split. If you're a Catholic, I'm talking now denominationally about all of these, your church is split. And I hate to say this, but we are not immune to the polarization that's represented by the ripening harvest, which represents things that are feeding off the spirit of the world versus those that are feeding off the spirit of God. And what I'm trying to say to you is this, this dividing over issues that we're going to talk about here today. So, for instance, these churches are all split over what the gospel is, what it means to be male and female, what it means to have a family, what it means relative to other issues of social ordering, whether or not you have the right to take the life of a baby. And by the way, it's double homicide if a drunk man runs into you and you're pregnant. Where's the consistency relative to the dynamics of a developing life? Seventh-day Adventists believe in the sanctity of life. We're not offering up to Moloch the infants, be the inside or outside the womb. What I'm telling you is the world is dividing and is divided. And if you think that dynamic's not in the Adventist church and coming to the Adventist church, I need you to stop and think again. I'm speaking about the fragility of an economic world. I'm talking about a president who in his verbiage uses the biblical word Armageddon. I can't make this stuff up. Now, when we had a crisis in Cuba, I wasn't even born yet. I might have come on the scene right as it was fading away. But the Cuban Missile Crisis predates me. But when I hear serious discussion of nuclear weaponry being used in a modern civilization, I better stop and say to myself, the doomsday clock, which is set by secular people, by the way, not Christians, is ticking down to its culmination. So I'm setting the stage in a divine warning at the beginning of this message to simply say this, life is not going on forever the way it has. I think they said something like that around the time of the flood, right? Things continued as they were. And they anticipate and do the same thing. But I'm encouraging you to read the book, Great Controversy. Familiarize yourself with it. And by the way, I, I was looking for a quote out of it the other day. And uh, I came into one of the last chapters. The very first paragraph was talking about when the laws to destroy those who keep the commandments are written and permission is had by the wicked to excise from the face of the planet those who think differently. It was very interesting, the language she, she used. She talked about excising dissent from the face of the planet. I want to tell you, when you excise dissent, when nobody can give an alternative opinion, when, when error is so fragile that it cannot even stand up to the, the ver verbalizing of truth, 
You've got problems. That's in our society right now in ways it didn't exist two years ago. I'm telling you, there are signs about us that we have not even thought about, let alone really ruminated on and reflected on. So I'm setting the stage right now, hopefully, to give you a tremendous sense of encouragement about God's role and your invitation to participate with him in what we know as the great Advent movement. Now, I'm going to be heavy for just a few more minutes before we go into some glorious opportunities and privileges. This sermon is entitled, The Angel in the Hour, the Shaking and the Power. Next week, we will celebrate almost, we're working our way up to one and three-quarter centuries since the great disappointment of October 22. And that great disappointment was grievous. And by the way, there was a shaking at the beginning of Adventism, and there'll be a shaking at the end of Adventism. You do not want to be shaken out. There were hundreds of thousands of followers who followed the Millerite Adventist message. It was a beautiful experience. The largest tent that had ever been produced was produced because the churches had shut them out and they needed a venue to hold their meetings in. And the single largest tent ever produced up to that point in time was, was made to hold the huge crowds that came to listen to these messages. The world was alive. And I want to tell you, the world's going to come alive to spiritual things again. But I do want to talk about the shaking for just a few minutes before I start in to the first of the three angels' messages. There is no text or text more central to Adventist identity than Revelation chapter 14, starting with verse 6. But I'm not quite ready to go there because I want to talk about the shaking for just a minute. She writes, in last day events, there will be a shaking of the sieve. The chaff must in time be separated from the wheat. Now listen to this. Two principles I want you to take away from this message. There's two ways the devil's going to shake you unless Christ holds you, in which case you can't be shaken. I love that verse. My favorite verse in the Bible, Philippians 3.12, let us take hold of that for which Jesus Christ has taken hold of me. I'm telling you, friends, there have been times when I wanted somebody to have me by the scruff of the neck. I came close to drowning once. The idea of somebody grabbing onto me and yanking me out of the undercurrent of that river was a wonderful thought. You may not feel like you've got the grip to hold on through what's coming in the future, but I want to tell you something. It's not your grip that saves you, although go ahead and practice tightening it. It's the grip of Jesus. There will be a shaking of the sieve. The chaff must be in time separated from the wheat because iniquity abounds. The love of many waxes cold. It is the very time when the genuine will be the strongest. Principle number one, the devil will shake you with a love of this world. The weeds will entangle themselves around you. And like somebody caught in an undertow with their feet tangled in the weeds just offshore, the devil will hold you there long enough to drown your love for Jesus. Like a big python that circles around its prey, every time it breathes out, the snake tightens down. The devil's not using persecution right now. He's using love of self. He's using love of the world. He's using idolatry. That's one way. The other way the devil's going to get you is fear. And by the way, love of self leads to the greatest fear of everything else. When you don't fear the face of man, but you fear God with holy reverential awe, and your salvation, your life is hidden in Christ, you're wearing the helmet of salvation, you don't have to be afraid. But because love of the world and iniquity abounds, that's what causes the shaking. It's easy for the devil to break our grip. Writing in early writings in 1850, she said, the mighty shaking has commenced and will go on and will be shaken out, all will be shaken out, who are not willing to take hold and take a bold and unyielding stand for the truth and to sacrifice for God and his cause. Now, I want you to listen to what I just read. You don't have to know everything there is to know. But I'll tell you, when a society is confronted with an issue like liberty of conscience, you get practiced up taking some bold stands by praying your way and understanding what God would have you to do and then not being embarrassed about it. And when you don't take any bold stands... And you don't learn what it feels like to hear the bullets whizzing by your head. Never have. I've heard they say it's quite a moment the first time it happens to you. When you don't feel the gale force winds in your face, 
When you're not sure if you can cross the channel and make it to the other side of that spiritual challenge or crisis or Jordan you're facing, there's something about taking a bold and unyielding stand for truth that goes hand in hand with not being released or releasing your grip on Jesus. Now, I wish I would have said that quote in a slightly different order because she wrote back in the early days of her life after the great disappointment that we are in the shaking time. What I need you to know about her perspective on this, it appears, is that there is and was an earlier shaking, and sometimes we go through periods of shaking, but there is a mighty shaking that is coming. She says, I was shown the people of God and saw them mightily shaken. Some with strong faith and agonizing cries were pleading with God. Some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. Now, I don't believe for a minute God wants you always in an agonizing, pleading condition. But if you think you're never going to be in a position where there's some agonizing and pleading going on, I don't know which Bible you're reading from. It was agonizing for Jacob to go back not knowing what was going to happen with his brother. It was agonizing for Abraham on Mount Moriah as he was ready to slay his son. It was agonizing for Joseph to be carted away to Egypt. It was agonizing to be thrown into the prison. There are moments when our spiritual experience goes through the depths of intimacy and the refining work is going on. We're going to come up to a moment in time where it doesn't matter how many bold stands we've taken and how strong we've been before, there's going to be about us enough pressure and in us enough temptation to uncertainty to where we're going to be wrestling with God, whether it's Jacob's time of little trouble before probation closes or whether it's some of the agonizing that might come as we realize that all lawful hurdles have been removed for our destruction, I don't know. But she said, I saw some did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. They seemed indifferent and careless. Now, if you grew up in this Adventist faith, you have a higher percentage of being in that category of people than some of us like me who grew up where the pain of living outside the law of God was around you a lot more often. They were not resisting the darkness around them. Listen to this now. It doesn't matter how many of your friends are doing what you're doing. It doesn't matter how many years you practice what you're practicing. They were not resisting the darkness around them, and it shut them in like a thick cloud. And the next sentence is almost worse. The angels of God left these, and I saw them hastening to the assistance of those who were struggling with all their energies to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But the angels left those who made no effort to help themselves, and I lost sight of them. As the praying ones continued their earnest cries, a ray of light from Jesus would come at times to encourage their hearts and light up their countenances. You know what causes the final mighty shaking? She says, the straight, some will not bear the straight testimony. It's worse than that, though. They will rise up against it. It's not that they really love the prophetic voice cutting across the grain of their life and wounding their sense of false security. It's that they actually rise up to war against it. And at that point in time, they declare they're on the other side. The Holy Spirit has wrestled with them, and now the Holy Spirit has left them. They, have, they are warring against the truth. That will cause a shaking amongst God's people. And one last part of a quote, talking about not doing in a time of peace what we should have done, the work which the church failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, she'll have to do in a terrible crisis and under the most discouraging, forbidding circumstances. The warnings that worldly conformity has silenced or withheld. If you're a preacher listening to me, I sure hope you're paying good attention. The warnings... That warning to God in the, from God in the garden, leave the tree alone. That was a gospel message. The warnings that worldly conformity has silenced or withheld must be given under the fiercest opposition from the enemies of faith. And at that time, the superficial class whose influence, this is, this is sad too, whose influence 
has steadily retarded the progress of the work will renounce the faith. Now, I hope you got the ramifications of what I've just read. There are people of a superficial dynamic whose influence is retarding the faith. And God finally says, the period of retardation is over. And he allows, through fierce opposition and persecution, for them to peel off and reveal that their love was really not. And when they're gone, there is a divine brotherhood and sisterhood fused and fertilized with the power of the Holy Spirit presence that makes the church a force that shakes the gates of hell. Now, since the shaking has some elements of ever-presentness with us, and since we understand that a love of the world and a superficial Christianity not only will impede the work now, but will set us up to actually release what we once considered so dear. I'm appealing to all my brothers and sisters that are here in this auditorium and to anybody that's watching online. Ellen White will tell us that a nominal Christianity is to be dreaded because it deadens our ability to discern our need of the gospel. All right. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. What an amazing, amazing story. I want to start by telling you that Revelation chapter 13, which is not where we're going, tells the story of a beast, a beast so powerful that for over a thousand years it will trample on God's people and on God's word. That same beast will receive a deadly wound. That wound is the wielding of the Bible in the hands and hearts and words and mouths of dedicated Christian men and women. That deadly wound allows the rising up of another power that is creating sanctuary for the freedom of expression and actually the protection of dissent. And in the midst of all of that, we know that even that lamb-like beast will eventually succumb to the overriding principles of humanity, which is a drift away from the principles of heaven, and that beast, the lamb-like beast, will speak like a dragon too. Now, we are living in that moment in time where it appears that for the sake of good, this social pragmatism, this effort to make sure we look out for everybody is undermining the roots of republicanism, and I don't mean the Republican Party, I mean the, a government that in law protects minority dissent. That is where we are at. But I want you to know something. Revelation 14 opens up, and it's if the message says, it's okay, don't be afraid, it's going to work out. Let's look at verse 1. Then I looked, and I behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of, of his Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000, those, those who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women. That's not a reference to marriage. That's a reference to the corruption of the ungodly woman that is written in the book of Revelation and others like her, including her daughters. They've kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They've been purchased from among men as the first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and no lie was found in their mouth, and they are blameless. I need you to know something. John, the revelator, shows us by inspiration one of the most terrifying scenes that he's ever seen. The church subjugated for more than a millennium, much suffering, much death, much anguish, much torture, much pain, much separation, much exile, all of these things, and it's almost overwhelming, and so it's as if God steps in and says, but wait a minute, yeah, it's going to be bad for a little while. We're going to let you see what the kingdom of Babylon looks like when it's in its ascendancy. Now, we know the kingdom of Babylon persecuted God's um, covenant people in the Old Testament. And we know that that kingdom fell two generations after Nebuchadnezzar did that. We know that the Medes and the Persians actually governed in Babylon for a bit. But eventually, about the time of the first century A.D., Babylon was a shambles. It was indeed a place for the owls and the jackals. But it is strange about that time that the Christian church understood that the persecuting power of Rome in its 
secular sense, which would morph into its religious sense, they began referring to it as mystical Babylon. So Babylon takes on its higher order of sense in the combining of religious and political and military power to subjugate the people of God. And we see what a kingdom run by the principles of Babylon. And by the way, Isaiah 14 tells us that the invisible leader of Babylon is Lucifer himself. So we see the principles of Babylon enacted in the medieval church and what we now call, even secular people do, the dark ages. We see the Roman church working to subjugate freedom of conscience, freedom of worship, all of these things. This is so disturbing to John. It's as if God steps in and says, but I need to show you how the story ends. And he shows the redeemed standing, as it were, singing almost like the song of Moses. It was a victory song, but there's a little more to do before we get there. So we have this interjection of divine victory, God leading his people on to the restoration of their citizenship in the new Jerusalem, in the kingdom in which he governs, but there's a little more to do before we get there, and that's the subject of the angel and the hour. Verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, and saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. You know, it was amazing to me to look at some of the secular commentators on these two verses. I cannot tell you how encouraged I was to read some of what they had to say. When we look at the dynamics of Babylon, our own commentary tells us, but for the Babylonians, they considered this their city, the gate of heaven. That's what Babylon really means. The Jews had a slight different word, Balal, and it came to mean to them confusion. But the term itself literally means gate of heaven. We see the spiritual warfare that's operating behind the scenes. Lucifer, indeed, it's king, the gate of God, but confusion. The truth of the matter is, is that mystical Babylon marches on in its power, and the deadly wound described in Revelation 13 is being healed. That's why we can have trips to speak to the senators and legal representatives of our nation several years ago. That's why at this moment in time we can have four and almost a half million views in 11 days of this video. The truth of the matter is, is that God describes a victory and he gives us a part in it. It says, I saw another angel. These are faithful ministers and people, the body of Christ, that are diligent to spread the gospel. Now, the Bible tells us that angels are anxious to look into the things that we're experiencing and the privilege that we have. The Bible says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. I need to tell you that in some of the quotes re referencing to the shaking, she makes it very clear that those who have no love for the lost and are doing nothing to reach the lost will be shaken. So if you find yourself in a condition today where it's super duper fine with you, if all the people who you cross paths with day in and day out don't know about these messages, it's a serious potential negative indicator of where things might be. You can't change that, but you could choose to say, Lord, give me a love for the lost. Of course, that was last week's sermon. But we need to understand that while Gabriel flew swiftly to Daniel and he came down and he talked to Zechariah and he talked to Joseph, these angels, which would love to be the messengers, this word really means a messenger not a literal angel flying in the midst of heaven is a global audience, and that gets clarified just a little bit more. The preaching is committed not to the angels, but it's committed to us. They'll preach the gospel, Gill's exposition says, publicly and openly with great freedom and boldness, with intrepidity, and, the, and in the view of all men, not fearing the faces of any. And the gospel ministered by them will have a swift, sudden, and universal spread. You go, Brother Gill, you're preaching the Adventist message. And by the way, friends, this church had an amazing beginning. The book of Zacharias tells us not to despise the day of small things. And a small handful of people in that Philadelphia time of church history did amazing things to take this gospel all around the world. But now in a Laodicean phase, working through wealth and stealth to rob us of a love of Christ and a love of his word, the gospel has slowed down significantly. So much so that I think it would be safe to say that in westernized countries, many churches are on the verge of extinction. 
And Adventism is not terribly far behind when it falls into the same worldly mindsets. But yet we are called into a swift and sudden proclamation of the gospel. The gospel will run and be glorified, and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. Multitudes will flock to Christ, who in that day, that is Jesus, will alone be glorified. You know what we used to say in our meetings as Adventists? We used to say the, th the three angels' messages to all the world in this generation. Shouldn't every generation know? Would it be easier a hundred years ago to get that message out than it is today? But how many minutes or hours are being frivoled away in wasted time and energy and absence of prayer for anyone, even our next door neighbor, let alone the person across the sea who's never even heard about Jesus? And so God is taking the work into his own hands in some measure, and people are having dreams and visions. Now, in those places, it's usually because Christians can't get in there. God's not typically stepping in in miraculous ways to do what we can and we should. And by the way, I don't know how to run a church that evangelizes the whole world when it can barely pay its own bills. Praise God this church is not in that position right now. Can you say amen? amen. Praise the Lord we have some money to pay stipends to people that want to come and learn how to do church here. Praise the Lord that we're not stuck begging the consumer parishioners for the opportunity to do the gospel work. It's a wonderful thing to actually have a little ammunition to put into the spiritual gun. And by the way, Spirit of Prophecy tells us the devil has a thousand batteries. That doesn't mean energizer bunnies. That means howitzers that he's waiting to unveil at a time when it looks like persecution ought to come out into the open. And she suggests that we're not quite ready for him. Maybe it's those bold stands and that bold commitment. Maybe it's moving a little money out of the 401 or the 404, whatever it might be, 403. Maybe it's actually selling something. I'm here to tell you, friends, if I knew I was on the cusp of eternity, I would still have to plan for the future because others have thought the same thing. But it's not been in too many modern ages that we've heard the commander-in-chief talk about Armageddon, is it? And maybe we've gone a little while since we've had a major financial reset, and maybe, as some prognosticate, it's all kind of a big bubble anyway. The angel and the hour flying in the midst of heaven, having the eternal gospel. Now listen, in chapter 13, the devil's raging against God's people. But in chapter 14, God's people come out strong. They're going to move. The gospel breaks out. It's shaking the foundations of the Antichrist and the world. And it is foretelling the downfall of Babylon. We must remember this. Jesus said the gates of hell will not be able to prevail. In the book of Isaiah, he says the spirit of justice and judgment will be poured out upon us to turn back the battle at the gates. I'd like to suggest to you that the church has been laid siege to and the battle is at the gates and we need the, the spirit of justice and judgment. We need the boldness of the gospel which will declare right and wrong and which will declare freedom to the slaves of Satan to break out of the city and God to turn back the battle at the gates. This gospel is eternal, Ionion. It has existed through eternal ages. It will exist into eternal ages. The gospel is, an, is eternal in its unalterable nature because its nature is the very nature of God. That's why Jesus would say eternal life is to know God. It's not a get out of jail free card. It's not get to skip past. It's actually an encounter with the liberating one who gives me liberty from dysfunction and sin and besetting addiction now and gives me eternal hope. The gospel is here called the everlasting or eternal because it's always existed. It remains forever unchanged and its effects will be everlasting. You get the sense that it's that old time religion. You get a sense that we need the old gospel to do the work of giving us a new heart. I'll tell you, friends, the tepid bartering with and bantering with the dynamics of sin in your life will only leave you more fettered over time uh, because of the nature of the carnal heart and mind than it would if indeed there was a clean break, like when you're trying to get nicotine out of your system. You know, you can chop the tail of the dog off, which some people think is inhumane to do, but if you are going to do it, make sure you get it in one chop. And that's why in those seminars, the great cleaver of clean, pure water and clean, pure juices and a clean break 
Old time religion doesn't parley with sin. It doesn't rationalize being rooted in the weeds that would seek to hold us down. The three angels' messages is the old gospel, which declares right and wrong. And by the way, friends, that right and wrong was declared even in the garden before there was sin. It's to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Why? It's a witness. Why is it a witness? Because if you read the second and the third, you find out that mystical Babylon, which is a corrupted and fallen church, is going to enforce its mark in some kind of active worship further on. Yes, this church is proclaiming the last opportunity to experience the grace of God before elemental fear, the fear that you might not be able to make a living and make your house payment, keep your car and put foot on the table, and beyond that, the fear that you could even live. What little bit of stress we experience in society in the last two years is but a drop in the bucket to the dynamics and difficulties that are coming. But this gospel is something else. Because the angel is crying out, fear God and give glory to him. Take your Bibles and turn over to Psalm 130. Psalm 130. There must be something about this fear uh, that must liberate people to be exceptionally bold. Psalm 130. Uh, we certainly cannot be living in a posture of continued insecurity because nothing of real worship or love could develop there. And indeed, this is what the psalmist teaches us. Psalm 130, verses 1 and onward. Out of the depths I've cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. You get a little sense of this spiritual wrestling that we were talking about at the beginning of this message in regards to the shaking. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities. In other words, if God was only keeping track of what we were doing that was wrong. Oh, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. There's nothing more glorious than a guilty person understanding the redemptive act of God to both pay the price of what's wrong and been done wrong and give the power to liberate to a new way of living. The character of God is such that he's not out there keeping track for the wrong reason. Records are kept indeed, and those records must be expunged by the blood of Jesus. But the purpose of it all is the exoneration of the saints, which is what takes place prior to the return of Jesus, the hour of judgment. But we haven't gotten there yet. Yes, David waited. But I would like for us to turn back to Psalm 108 while we're here as well. Go back to Psalm 108. Another psalm of amazing deliverance. Psalm 108. We'll look at verses 1 to 6. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing praises even with my mouth. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken to the dawn. It's the psalm of David. I'll give thanks to you, O Lord, amongst the peoples, and I'll sing praises to you among the nations. For your loving kindness is great above the heavens, and your truth reaches to the sky. Well, I don't think there's a competition between loving kindness and truth. I'm kind of thinking they're all the same thing because it would be a bad thing that somehow that uh, truth is getting ahead of loving kindness. No, indeed, the truth is, is that God is lovingly kind and he's willing to pay the price. Verse 5, be exalted, O God, above the heavens and your glory above all the earth that your beloved may be delivered. You see, friends, when you're praising God, when you're fearing Him, and you're giving Him great glory, it's because what's in your heart is a knowledge of your own deliverance and a future knowledge of deliverance from the sting of death. And this kind of freedom and this kind of assurance gives you a boldness to preach the gospel and live the gospel and live without fear. The hour of judgment is a reference to Daniel, chapter 7 and Daniel 8, under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. I won't in this sermon go into the details, but you need to know something. The appearance of Christ was prophesied to the year, to the month, to the day. The appearance of Jesus moving from his ministry of mediation in the holy place into his vindication in the most holy place was prophesied to the day. The Millerites got it wrong. They thought it was an executive form of judgment. Instead, it was an investigative form of judgment. And it was not investigating to keep the saints out it was legitimating and vindicating to get the saints in with all the peace and enthusiasm an angel could have as he had watched us in some of our not-so-glorious ways and our not-so-glorious days. 
And for those of you that are Greek scholars, the word krima is talking about the sentencing of judgment. But the word krisis is the act of judging. And by the way, this can't be the final judgment, whether you know Greek or not, because the hour of invitation is still underway. So the good news is, is that while there's a judgment that starts, which is God's assurance dynamic for all of those who are going to receive us as new citizens of heaven, there is a gospel message being proclaimed. So it can't be the final executive judgment. If it's perfectly in the progression of the sanctuary, Christ as the lamb sacrificed in the outer courtyard, in reality on a cross. Christ in the holy place after ascending to heaven where he ever lives to make intercession. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Glory, hallelujah. And finally, still on our side, not against us, to find some little detail he hadn't noticed before, is a vindicating moment before he actually comes on the clouds. In 1844, they expected the world to catch on fire and them to receive their inheritance. What would catch on fire was a greater knowledge of what the gospel was, and this message would transform itself into delivering to Christendom a theology which did not currently exist, and that was the theology of the ministry of the heavenly sanctuary, of which the one on earth was just a symbol. But the one in heaven was the reality. And before time and eternity, God's character had established a plan for those who would take the power and freedom and stewardship of free choice and twist it the wrong way. Now, we also know from 1 Peter 4, 17. Let's look this one up. Go to that little book just before Revelation. I think we should look at it. It's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to look at it. Because all of this fits in tightly to a beautiful theology of complete explanation with nothing to hide. God has nothing to hide. And I want you to see that Peter enunciates the idea that those who know God, they are evaluated and looked at first. And before Jesus returns, and by the way, the scriptures say he will bring his reward with him, those who deserve it are shown to all those who have never fallen that they do deserve it. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? There's something about this gospel that allows all people, the unfallen beings that occupy heaven and the ones that are going to be reinstituted into their heavenly estate, there are no secrets. God is going to spend, which is not my subject, morning this, subject this morning, but even after we go to heaven, nobody will be executed for a thousand years. During that thousand-year period of time we call the millennium will be a time of understanding and grieving because our human hearts along with God's heart will have to be prepared for the final executive phase of judgment. When it comes down to the componentry of our theology, we believe that Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty for our sins. We believe he then took the antitypical, which is just kind of a big word that means we're no longer talking in types. Anti against, typical type. What Jesus is doing is he's actually fulfilling the reality of the sandbox version of salvation. So what they practiced in the wilderness was showing them what would become reality in the heart experience and life of God. He would be the lamb, he would be the priest, and he would be the high priest. And finally, sin would be cleansed from the camp and we would all be reunited again. Yes, indeed, this is a glorious message. Back to Revelation chapter 14. And worship him who made heaven and earth. We find ourselves, strangely enough, right back at the Garden of Eden, just where society is. Now, let me say a word or two about this. In 2015, we legitimized in law a bold strike at the order of creation. In the creation moment, there's at least three distinct things God did. He established a divine encounter after our Sabbath school pointed out very clearly how wonderfully intimate the creation of man was. And he was given work, but he was given a divine encounter with God. It was actually a life raft that was also there lest man should choose sin, that he would not be without divine legal permission and direction to stop and know that this sin wasn't going to be forever. It was the Sabbath rest. It's repeated in the book of Exodus. It's repeated in Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law. 
It was lived out by Jesus. It was lived by the apostles. The Sabbath is at the center of all worship. It is not the sum of all worship, but it is a statement of worship. Just like marriage, standing at the altar, is not the sum of love, but it is an expression of love. Yes, indeed, we find ourselves dealing with worship. Number one, in the garden, before sin, Sabbath, before sin. It was not the law of God gives liberty, according to the book of James. It was never nailed to the law, to the cross. Those shadowy types and symbols that related to some of their civil dynamics had limited shelf life. But the Sabbath existed before sin. It was never nailed to the cross. The second thing was marriage. God created a man and a woman, and he gave them love. And Solomon tells us that if you trade all the wealth of your house for, for love, it would be utterly scorned. Yes, there's nothing like love. You want no love? You've got to release sin from your life because it's self-love and it wars against love for somebody else. The third thing God did, and I didn't get these in order, of course. I kind of went backwards, but he made them male and female. Walt Heyer was at a meeting I was at recently. He's probably one of the first to really come out as a transgender person. About a month ago on a Friday night, he spoke in an event I was at with Liberty and Health Alliance. He said there's no such thing as transgenderism. Now, mind you, he went through all the surgeries, maybe more than one. I don't know about his story, certainly more than one, but maybe many to become supposedly a woman and maybe others to come back to being a man. But he stood that night in the pulpit and he said, there is no such thing as transgenderism. The knife can be applied to your body, but every cell in your body defines you one way or the other. This is where we're at today, friends. We are in a position in society where we thought in 2015 when we legitimated in law that a marriage could be between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. And by the way, friends, we're to love everybody. We're not in the condemnation business. The law does define right and wrong, but we must be the most noble, beautiful people, extending the most glorious gospel that leads people to, to give glory to God and, and to have a great sense of reverential fear. But I want to tell you, these things, some of them are so recent. Who would have thought that in a period of a very few years, we could actually have the dynamic at what age you're going to sexualize the knowledge of your kids by the way, a lot of our kids are over at the outdoor church today with our church school. Who would have thought that we'd be locked in a battle, that our children should be, have innocency expunged from their life by creating dynamics of mature understanding in their little hearts and minds that they weren't ever supposed to mess with? That's where we're at. I'm telling you, we are not far away from the unveiling of the thousand batteries that are hidden. The age of self-indulgence and self-love is coming to an end. The dysfunction, the clutter, the social societal pollution that's cluttering the path forward is building up enough to where eventually we're going to see this amazing switch to what is spiritual. And all of a sudden, spiritual manifestation is going to be out on the table. And we're going to find persecution as a very real tool of the devil again. But I'm here to tell you, our preparation for standing true for Jesus Christ is going to come in many ways. It's not just in standing up for the Sabbath. It's standing up for the sanctity of life. It's standing up for moral relationships. It's sometimes standing up to a spouse or a child or a fellow believer or a friend. There is a boldness and a nerve. And by the way, I just have to say this. You know, Daniel was taken as a, a captive. You know? And I'm sure he was a smart man. So I'm sure he thought to himself, I'm going to get put in an awkward position. And I'm sure he could have said to himself, this food stuff's not a big deal here. I'm going to keep my powder dry for a future real trial. I want you to think about this. That's not what he did. I was listening to a book called Leaders Eat Last recently. The author quoted some other religion. I'm not big into other religions, but truth is truth. And they said, well, how you do anything is how you do everything. Sounds a little bit like faithful in little, faithful in much, doesn't it? I want you to be thinking about what I'm saying here. God is calling us. If you're too busy to stop time for Sabbath, if we're not guarding the edges of this, if you're too busy, this pastor will never quit talking about this, just so you know. If you're too busy to come out to the prayer meeting on Wednesday night, you might be too busy. Now, I know some of you work, and I don't have a clipboard, but I can tell the difference between how many people are here right now and how many people are here on Wednesday night. And I'm not even a rapid calculating statistician. But I'm rejoicing that there are lots of people out at the prayer meeting. I'm just appealing for more. The truth of the matter is, worship is going to cost us everything. So if we don't have time for it now, how do we think we're going to have the price to pay then? 
Worship is also how we live. It's the service of godly consistently. Inward reverence to God and outward glorification of Him. Now I want to tell you something. When I got up this morning, I'd been looking at the weather and I thought to myself, hmm, it's going to be a cloudy Sabbath. I really don't like cloudy Sabbaths. <laughs> Uh, but I left my house at about 7.15. And as I rolled down the road and got out of the woods, I could see the sun was going to come up. And you know what? I decided I was going to check that weather app out. And you know, before you get your lunch done today, there aren't going to be any clouds in the sky, according to the weather app. I'm here to tell you that the God who makes this world spin on its axis and the sun comes up and the moon is out when it's supposed to be and the tides ebb and flow and the rain comes... And the things grow. I'm here to tell you, friends, the one who could have harnessed the locusts in the exodus from Egypt and the conquest of Canaan, he's still very much alive. I'm here to tell you, he knows when a sparrow falls and he knows the number of hairs on your head. I'm here to tell you that the greatest privilege you will ever have is to serve the church, which will go through into eternity. It began back in the garden. It was reconstituted in the wilderness, and it was reorganized and re-energized after the cross. It's gone through some hard times, but this admin of faith has been vibrant and alive and strong, and its identity is in this messaging with total sold out to the gospel, whether it makes you my friend or my enemy. Jesus comes first, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile, and it's glorious good news. God's not keeping track of what I do wrong to keep me out, he is glorifying me through the indwelling power of the Holy Presence in you too. And he wants the world to know the opportunity for grace is almost up. Babylon's fallen. And don't receive the mark of the beast, I'll tell you. The wound is healing. The world is wandering. And the day is coming. The shaking won't be a terrible big surprise. Although it will startle us. This church was shaken in the beginning. It'll be shaken again. If I actually walk with Jesus, even if I fall asleep, when I hear the cry, the bridegroom cometh, if I was walking with Jesus and there's some oil in my lamp, I'll be surprised how brightly the wick is kindled and the taper is cut for the glory of my dear Lord. I don't want to be left out. While on others thou art passing, do not pass me by. That's not about salvation. Jesus went out of his way to save people. That's about being available to be used, my friend. Some of you are young. Your career might need a different trajectory. You've heard God's voice saying, I want you to do this. Well, you won't make as much money and you'll have to get your hands dirty dealing with the church. By the way, sometimes some churches are not nearly as happy and healthy and focused as this one is. Praise the Lord for this one. But I'm here to tell you, for all the ignominy and the suffering and the prayerful mediation and the long nights and the hard work, friends, the most important thing you're doing is advancing the cause of God. So what if you're not doing it? You're just taking up time hoping that you'll get in and you don't care about anybody else? Doesn't work that way. Go back to last week's sermon. Friends, Jesus was abandoned. He warned his disciples there'd be a shaking, and that night when they came with clubs for him, everybody fled. And nobody was, no, everybody said they wouldn't. I'm here to tell you, Jesus told them what he's saying to you and me. I've prayed for you. He ever lives to make intercession, and he's praying for you and me, and he can get us through, and we can stand on Mount Zion and sing the song of the Lamb, just like they stood on the other side of the Red Sea. Friends, throw your lot in with this great Advent movement. It hasn't been moving so well lately, but it's going to start back up. And when it does, you wouldn't want to be left behind. May God bless us as we recommit ourselves to being the messengers of the hour and enduring the shaking and receiving power. Amen.